Ryan, how's it going? What's going on, Jay? How are you? Good. Can you hear me right? I can. It's perfect. Man, figured it out. Holy smokes. Well done. Um, technology uh, challenge here, so. It's becoming it more and more a part of our lives. It's a little bit hard to ignore like it used to be. It is. It is. Unless You're at home in Montana, good. I take it? I am. Yep. Yep. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. Kind of slower period for you, kind of pre shows, post hunt, chill out before the holidays. It is. Um, man, I feel like just starting today is my first day of relaxation. Back nice. home, get to hang with the kids for a while. They had a half day of school today, um, going through Christmas. So yeah, lots to lots to just settle into here. It's been a long season and um had a lot on the pal on the plate and just trying to wrap it up and get on with the family life now so what's christmas like for you guys big deal little deal it's a big deal yeah Yeah. i mean my my girls absolutely love it especially my little you know she's gonna be up at 4 a.m for sure christmas morning um but now we love it we're a little bummed we don't have any snow this year so um man it's just been a a really uh dry we've had very little and when it comes in it kind of blows away but hardly any wind, hardly any precipitation. It's been warm. We're like swimming in the forties and 50 degrees and it's December in Montana, if you can believe that. So yeah, it's been bizarre. Um, not complaining, but on the other side, I know we need some snow in the mountains. It's uh, pretty bare bones up there right now. It's been wild everywhere, man. So I live in Vancouver, so it's not odd mm-hmm. for us to get like kind of rainy, kind of, kind of warm ish yeah. weather, but we usually get a skiff for Christmas. Okay. And I was in Saskatchewan for whitetail this year and one dude saw a bear from the stand in like middle of November. Like, and it's just, everybody's whitetail season seemed to be out with the lunch this year because just like with muleys, you need the snow to push them down. You kind of need cold and snow to do what they're going to do to kind of limit some of the movement for these animals and get them to, to, uh, you know, take on more predictable behavior patterns. So we kind of get a better shot and it just, yeah, it seems to have been creating havoc all over the place. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. It's been a, it's been an odd one. I, I gotta say though, uh, the last five years of weather has more than compensated for this lack of this year. We, we are, um, you know, I always think of the animals first and when it comes to mule deer and antelope and all that, we needed a uh, right. kind of a, a light winter like we're having right now. Now yeah. things could change. We could have a extended spring. We could get crunch um, on the ground that lasts forever, but so far so good. The mule deer had really, really needed this break this year. After last year's, man, we had snow in October and it went through late spring and it just was relentless. And we're seeing the effects of that on the on the herd around here, no doubt about it. Yeah, and it seems to be, I know I had Robbie on the podcast earlier this year, and Idaho has had a couple just horrific winters back yeah. to back. And I don't think, you know, the average lay people understand, especially when you start stacking two, three, four bad winters on top of each other, what oh, type of detriment that is to herd health. And Robbie's one of the best at at kind of, um, you know, paying attention to that, you know, where, yeah. he's li- where he lives. And he's a big buck uh, follower, lover. And I know it's just a kick to the guts when he yeah. sees a winter like we had last year and just seeing everything struggle and all the carcasses. And yeah, it's, it's hard to watch, hard to see, but, um, yeah, we need, we need uh, win- old man winter to kind of lighten up on us. And so far this year, it's been pretty good, but on the other side, we still need snow on the mountains. We don't want them, uh, rivers running dry on us and the creeks going bare this, this next summer. So I got a feeling it'll, it'll co it'll come, it'll show up a little late, but We'll see. Yeah. yeah. So I'd kind of like to start, I'd like to dig in a little bit deeper to kind of a bit more of your early story and I'll, I'll give some context, but I'd be interested. Obviously you've hunted from a, a young age. It was always a very important part of who you are. One of the things that I'm particularly fascinated with you is your level of drive and the, the mm-hmm. kind of quiet drive that you have. And I was trying to think, a, I wonder where that comes from. And then I thought, I wonder if hunting was always this goal oriented. Cause I know some people who hunted since they were a kid, but it was always just like a kind of fun thing and set up a wall tent, a logging road. And if we get something we do, and if we don't, we don't, what was it like, you know, growing up in the Lampers household? Was it always approached mm-hmm. with this 
level of like grit and tenacity? And is that, is, is that part of what's transferred into your later years for you? Yeah, that's an easy one. I, I absolutely got it from my father, from okay. my dad. He, um, just the drive and the, uh, I think it's the drive to just figure things out. You know, he's, uh, he's a guru in all things, salmon fishing, steelhead fishing, fishing in general, um, uh, big time bird hunter. But, you know, growing up, my world revolved around like chasing chuckers in the mountains, doing the hard stuff when it comes to bird hunting. But fishing was a big part of our world. It was our business. It was our playtime. Uh, my dad absolutely lived for it. Uh, we built our life around fishing. And, and so, you know, he's the kind of guy, he's, he's probably one of the most well-known guys on the, on the coast of Washington, just for his tenacity on the water. The man never quits. He, uh, he stays out, he gets out there before anybody else does. He on a slow day, he never quits. He's there all day long and he's the last one in. And he's done that with his fishing. He does it with his hunting and, and, uh, you know, he doesn't get after big game much and he never really was all that into big game. Uh, to be honest, you know, we'd absolutely did some, we chased bears and, and got some really good muleys and elk and all that, but his passion was fishing. And if you want to be the best, um, when it comes to like a, a coastal blackmouth fisherman, you got to have a drive. You got to be able to duke it out in the weather. Right. You got to be able to sit out those slow days. You got to be willing to change your tactics, you know, 20, 30, 40 times a day, whether it's colors, you know, speed, whether you're trolling, whatever, however you're fishing. But, um, I think, uh, I think that came from him and, and it translated to me working in Alaska and doing the same thing up there. And I built a name for myself as far as, um, being a fisherman that just could figure it out and, and get it done. And, um, that translated well for being, a one of the top guides up there. And, um, you know, you know I think, I think the guys that I look at and I respect the most are the ones that can just kind of um, get through anything. You know, they'll figure it out. They'll dial it in. They never just quit thinking about what might work. And uh, they just figure it out, man. I have all kinds of respect for the guys that do that. And I've got a lot of those men in my family that that are just like that, from my dad to my uncles. Um, you know, they were raised on a dairy farm down on Whidbey Island. And uh, they're just a bunch of hardworking men that they are thinkers and they just want to figure it out with the help or not the help of anybody else. Um, so, you know, I, I owe a lot of my drive. I feel like to him. When did the fascination with big game, because as well known as you were for fishing, I think mm. it's safe to say you're now better known for your success with big game and your obsession with big game specifically mature animals so when did that kind of get its grip yeah so you know i would say fairly early on um you know i i got my first deer when i was very young um and then you know we just it just happened to work better for me you know going through school and and doing all the other things with the business to be kind of a weekend warrior uh, out chasing chuckers and we would chase chuckers uh you know filling a you know getting a bag limit of chuckers was a big deal like we that was our goal every time we went out and did it and when you did it it felt like a really big accomplishment because uh if you've hunted chuckers out west in some of the rugged shale country of the breaks the snake breaks the columbia breaks you know you feel like you've earned it you know you've you've hiked your tail off for the most part and we didn't have the best of dogs growing up so we just had to make it happen and make it work but inevitably you know uh as a teenager, I was, I was still chasing mule deer. Um, my first deer came from a, a wilderness trip that my dad just dropped me off basically. And, and I went in and found myself in an environment that, um, put me on a, a four point buck for my first deer. I got lost that trip, went the <laughs> wrong direction for a long time and, um, happened to run into a camp of, uh, of hunters that had been drop camped in by some outfitter in a fog bank and it was like i just happened to see this dude walking right in front of me across this space and i was like no way. did i really see what i just saw and he was grabbing some wood and taking it into this white wall tent that i couldn't even see 
and I just poked my head in and, uh, you know, here's this young kid, uh, 14 years old or whatever, 13. And, and, uh, I was basically like, where am I guys? Like, <laughs> where That's are we crazy. here? I no idea. They're like, who is and, this insane kid? No, they wanted me to stay at camp with them. And yeah, they gave me a few snacks. I had, uh, dumped my backpack and gloves far back where I first saw this buck. The buck ended up, uh, you know, I saw him, I went after him. He took me a long ways from where I thought I was going to get him. And, uh, yeah, I just ended up in this hole and, and took a wrong way out. And, but in the end, I found my way out of there. Those gentlemen helped me out, um, of this place. They, you know, I told them I can't stay. My dad's going to be looking for me. I know he is. Um, you know, I'm sure he's scared to death for just, uh, let me go out into this wilderness. And, uh, yeah, we reconnected things like one, two in the morning when I finally got caught back up to my dad on a trail, they were trying to find me. And that was my first experience with deer. Um, and I, I fell in love with it then with my first buck and, you know, needless to say, it was, it was a hard hunt and it scared the dickens out of me. But I think we all know hard things, you know, you, you look back on them and you just absolutely love them, you know, for whatever reason you respect them and, and you want to do it more. So, you know, that was my entry into big game hunting. And from there, you know, we did a lot of deer hunting from that. I happened to meet a very, um, knowledgeable old time guy in Idaho. Uh, his name was Dallas blood and he was, uh, kind of my mentor when it came to elk hunting, you know, I was guiding, um, you know, I had done some elk hunting. We, we had chased muzzleloader bulls in Idaho for years but I never really got into the archery side of it. And when I got into the archery side of it, that's when I fell in love with, with that. Um, you know, it's just a ton of fun chasing bugling bulls. And I met this guy and he took me under his wing and, um, you know, I spent, you know, the first two Septembers with him basically living in his house in Idaho, um, for just from a gentleman I met guiding. And, uh, he showed me all things elk hunting. You know, he taught me how to pick fights and, and what to do, what not to do. Um, he gave me tips and tricks that were not the norm and, uh, were not getting used by a lot of people. And it was a incredible, you know, cut to the learning curve for me. And I respected the heck out of this, this just down to earth gentleman. And, and he donated a lot of time to me and I, I will always be thankful for that. He has since passed, but, um, that was my, that was my really first passion into the elk side of things and from there i i came back to washington and i just hammered on roosevelt bulls for years and years and years and then also uh when i would draw something go to the other side of the the uh crest trail there and and hunt rockies on the other side but um you know in my 20s is when i really really kind of figured things out when it comes to big game and i kind of left bird hunting uh in the backdrop at that point so do you ever miss those times when you when you didn't have the ability to pinpoint your exact location on a cell phone? <laughs> Do I miss those times? Man, that's a good question. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I I uh, I feel like um, you know, having the ability to always know where you're at, it, yeah. it's something that I think the younger generation has no idea what a luxury that is. Yeah, that's for sure. But back in the day, you're always worried about getting lost. You're always worried about going the wrong direction. So, you know, compass work was a necessity and it's a very important skill to have, no doubt about it. Um, map work, but you know, now we just have it easy. You know, it's, um, everything's at your fingertips, you know, and I don't think, I don't think I'd ever want it to go back. I can assure you that Jay. <laughs> I, I miss the development opportunities it gave. So I was a forestry engineer for 15 years in BC. And when I started, there was no GPS. I'm 45 now. There's no GPS, no nothing. And we used to start and we did some pretty rugged layouts. So you're heading off into the mountains and you run a hip chain, little piece of string and you're, you know, everything is compass bearings and triangulating your location on a map. And I don't, I don't want to go back to that, but I like the foundation that gave me like the comfort in the hills understanding basic concepts that are going to protect you moving forward and ability to read maps and understand topo and just almost the confidence it gave you as well. Cause I do feel like it, 
you know, you'd be hard pressed if you took a dozen guys who'd started hunting in the last five years and said, take a bearing on this map and get like, they wouldn't even know how to put the compass on the map. And that's the only part that for me a little bit, because, and it's not because I think I had to do it. You had to do it. Not at all. I think I grew a lot from that experience and I almost wish other people had that same opportunity for growth. Sure. No, I think for a safety, you know, just putting that out there, you know, it's, uh, like you said, I think if you took a hundred guys that maybe we pay attention to on social media today, younger guys that have never had to do a lot of map work, you know, they grew up in an Onyx or, you know, whatever mapping app that they, they use now. And if they were to lose their phone Mm -hmm. out in the middle of a wilderness and they weren't familiar with the terrain, how many of those guys would make it out? Yep. Um, I think it's scary that, uh, probably not many, you know, probably not many. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think, uh, the knowledge gained by, you know, keeping the apps closed and figuring it out, you know, the old school way, valuable information. Absolutely. I don't miss it. Um, I don't miss that side, but I know it's valuable because you lose your phone and it's easy to do, you know, you fall in a river, you don't have access to your apps and you're in unfamiliar terrain, man, you could have a disaster on your hands real quick. So. Well, I, uh, I like to tell this story because I think it's an important lesson to learn. I flew in for sheep two years ago and uh, had a little alpaca raft with me and I we just got dropped off and I'm going across the lake to go hike in. I'm solo and I take my phone out to do something with me. And it was funny because I was doing a gear review of a new um, bino harness and it didn't have the same cell phone pocket I was used to. So I kind of just set it on my lap and I'm just rowing across. Everything's good. I go to get it to the other side and I go to get out and I kind of had this incident on shore and ended up kind of like rolling out of the raft and I had this moment panic. I'm like, where's my phone? Mm. Stripped down nude, emptied my bag. I'm on my hands and knees and it's a glacier fed lake. It's like green milk. You can't see two inches and yeah. uh, phone's gone, man. And here's the deal. 15 years with paper maps in my pockets, I got complacent. I hadn't even brought and that's the other problem with that confidence is it makes you complacent. And I had to fly out, man. Luckily enough, I, I flew out, I got the gear I needed and I went back in and I, you know, I had 12 days, so I still had an opportunity to get my hunt, but it was like, this is a guy who knows what he's doing. And it was just, it was, um, a mission critical error on my part. And it was one of those lessons. And that's why I like to share it because it's like, you know, that complacency can, you know, not only kill a hunt, it, you, you could die from something like that. So I, now it's like paper map, no matter what, don't care when. Yeah. And, um, it, yeah, yeah it's and I've even up. gone to a secondary nav device. Cause even my inReach at the time, and this is the other, and another important lesson to learn. I thought my inReach I could use for a nav device cause it had GPS. But the problem is without a paper map to put your GPS coordinates on the map and there is no background layers loaded on the inReach, Right. I could have taken points and referenced those points, but I had no way to know where I was in relation to the greater terrain. And so what I thought was a backup plan was not an, an appropriate backup plan. So huge learning opportunity, man. Yeah, that stuff yeah, can be pretty dangerous when it happens. Yeah, most of us don't have a secondary device, right? No. Um, you know, there's, there's, I sometimes I'll carry two devices. I, I carry an inReach always. I love it. I love yep. the fact that it's integrated to the phone. Totally. Um, the fact that if you lose your phone, you know, you can still thumb out a message if you have to. Or I couldn't know, have phoned uh, the pilot without it. Yeah, exactly. I, but there's other devices out there that, um, you know, they'll, they'll allow you to be tracked. You know, you hit the check mark. I've got a bivy stick as well. The only problem is I can't, I can't communicate with my wife. I can't. Yeah. You know, when they, when you hit that SOS button and they check in with you, you know, I've, I've mistakenly hit the SOS on my inReach before and, yeah. and it's nice to be able to thumb back a message and say, my mistake, sorry, don't come, please don't come. Um, whereas some of the devices, you don't really have that opportunity. Now, uh, I think having a secondary, like you say, paper maps, whatever, um, works for you having some secondary device. I carry two cell phones now, so. Uh, there you go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to everybody. It's not my advice, but I do. Um, I've just got one extra one in my pack and it's synced up with my inReach as well as my primary phone. That way, you know, cause I always keep my phone either in my bino or mm-hmm. in my pocket. 
And uh, I've been really lucky not to dump that thing, but it's going to happen at some point. It's inevitably it's going to happen. I know it will. So I just want to be ready for it. No, I think that's a great idea. And these days that can be done pretty expensively. I moved to the Garmin 66i. So it has the mapping functionality of a traditional Garmin with the background layers, but then it still has the eye for the in-reach compatibility. So it serves both functions. Um, so I carry that and the, so I'm probably a little over <laughs> mapped at this point, but it'll, I know it's going to take quite a few years for that experience to kind of wear off. Sure. So back to kind of your development as a hunter and what it means to you, have you noticed a, a change? And I'm sure there has been, I'm just curious what, so I have an eight year old daughter, so I'm kind of going through this myself, but from a youth, you know, with your dad, to in your 20s and 30s, making a mark as your own man, to now having a young family of your own, how has the meaning of hunting and what it's brought into your life changed over the years? Oh, man. Um, I mean, it's absolutely changed. You know, I think, you know, in the early days, like most young men, we're pretty selfish. At least I was. Mm -hmm. I'll speak on my behalf, I guess. Um you know, I did a lot of the hunting for selfish reasons, reasons, you know, most folks know I'm pretty introverted. I don't really like being a face of anything. Um, and yet we make films somehow that's happened, but I, I really don't like being seen and, um, or heard actually. So it's not my, my favorite thing. Um, and yet I realized like in my twenties, it was all about me. I would have right. been the guy out there screaming now, like, let's not bring any more guys into the hunting space, you know, let's keep this quiet, you know, less boots on the mountain. And, you know, I've changed over time. I've been softened by having a great wife and two amazing daughters. And, uh, and I've maybe not softened, but I've wisened up, you know, I've realized it's not just about me. We got a future here. We got to think about that. You know, I'm raising two girls that I want to be, I want them to be independent. I want them to have the same, um, abilities and, um, for hunting that I had growing up. I know we're really lucky to grow up in this time. I worry about the future, but you know, we do, we do events now that, um, are kind of, kind of related to mentoring, you know, folks that just didn't have, you know, a father that took them out when they were growing up or they just didn't grow up with it. They didn't have somebody in their life to take them out there. And so I've completely changed to, wanting to not talk about it to now trying to help those that are, they got questions about it. You know, they, they really wonder. And, you know, the fact of the matter is I was extremely lucky. I had a father that did it. I had a father whose father taught him to do it. So my father taught me to do it. Um, I couldn't imagine being grown, you know, just growing up in an urban environment or having somebody that, that didn't hunt or being raised by a single mother. I mean, that's, so common so prevalent out there mm -hmm. and it, i feel feel bad for the people that just don't understand they don't know what's out there for them as men and uh, i think it's important for for men to to do these things so um you know we've seen with our summits we've seen so many whatever you want to call it the old adult onset folks that are yep. just getting into it they've got a lot that they have yet to learn um they got a million questions and they don't really know where to start and so I found myself in this role now where I want to answer everybody's questions. So I spend too much time on Instagram answering questions. Um, and then we dedicate basically the month of June to bringing people out to these events and, and going through those questions and having other, um, subject matter guys, you know, talk them through and, and really try to shortcut their knowledge so that they're able to go out and harvest some animals and fill freezers for themselves. So, Mine has changed drastically. Um, and again, I will give much credit to my wife because um, I might st still be that selfish prick that just wants to be left alone and have all hunting just for me out there. But, uh, you know, I think with age, we smarten a little and um, now it's, it's become more of a mentorship role. And, you know, I've got a daughter who's 14 now. She's been hunting since she was 11. And so my view of things has changed a lot. You know, I don't, I don't take her out on these incredibly difficult hunts where I find satisfaction. Right. You know, I want to kick my ass out there. I want to beat myself up to the point of exhaustion. That's what makes me feel good. That's, yes. what's, that's what makes me feel like I earned it. 
I'm not going to do that with my daughter. You know, I want her to enjoy this. I want her to get a lot of time, um, not just trigger time, but time with me that's enjoyable, you know, right. and not just the hardship. You know, some people don't like to struggle that much. And I, you know, I, it's not for everyone, but my daughter is finding that um, because I've been a little easier on her, in fact, like where I take her is a little less strenuous than where I'd like to go. Yeah. Um, but in that, man, she is a strong, strong kid. I mean, she will out hike folks. Uh, most of my hunting buddies, I will put it out there. She will out hike you guys. She's just tough. She wants to throw the whole deer on her pack and, and one trip it out. If I let her, she'd do it. Um, so I feel like I must be doing something right, but yeah, my focus now is more on, you know, when I look at my 2024 calendar, trying to, trying to stack some hunts up there around her, right. they're all based around her. Like, um, obviously I've got my other hunts. I can only take her out of school for so many days, Jay. Yeah. That's the struggle. Like, yeah. I, uh, you know, we play this game of, well, how many absences can you have? Yeah. Um, cause I feel like, you know, there's a lot more value out there, but I also got to watch it and, a week out of school is, is about my max right now. So I try to get her on as many hunts as I can and I'm just having fun with that. And I look forward to that more than anything. I think that's a really great insight to share because one of the best pieces I, of advice I had, and I, I am dealing with that urban environment. I live, you know, basically downtown Vancouver, you know, my kid goes to school in the city. My wife's a vegetarian. So it's like, I'm, I'm fighting a lot of battles, but the piece of advice I got in regards to the outdoors with my kid and this is somebody who knows me very well and what a grinder I tend to be was like, just make it fun, man. Yep. And I had, and we started with truck camping. We're going to do our first like backpack scouting trip this year, but really kept it easy, brought tons of snacks, let her watch a bit of the iPad. Like I wanted her to have positive associations between, okay, when we go to the outdoors, I'm having fun. I'm with dad. He's present. He's paying attention to me. The phones are away and this is our time. And then slowly kind of working in that other stuff. And it seems to be working. She likes it. She can't wait to go. Are we going camping again this summer? And like, she loves it. And I do think, yeah. And I've had to, most people would laugh knowing me to see me camping with my daughter. It's like the most, you know, the easiest form of camping you can possibly imagine, but I, the priority has always been, I need her to have fun first. We'll put the learning and the challenge and all that other stuff, you know, further down the road. Yeah. And that's, that's huge. Yeah. Snacks, a lot of laughs yes. and hopefully a lot of animals to look at just keeps, keeps them in it. You know, I remember when, uh, when my girls were really young, when Paley was really young, but my, one of my worries that I, that kept me up at night was like, uh, like what's, there's got to be some trick to getting your, your kids to love this thing. Like we love it, you know? Yeah. And I, I didn't know what that was. Um, I came to the realization finally, it's like, well, they're either going to love it or they're not. All I can do is show them the reasons why I love it. Take them out there. Try not to beat them up too bad. Um, like you said, make it enjoyable. I think that is key. Um, and yet everybody's so different. My dad didn't make it enjoyable for me. Like right. he did not do it that way. Like I said, on my first deer hunt, I mean, we were in a edge of a wilderness. He dropped me off. He just let me go in and they were <sighs> putting a half of snow on the ground. Um, it was hard knocks back then. And if I couldn't keep up, like when we were going out chasing birds, I just get left behind. So, um, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't the easy road that he took with me. But I feel like with my daughters, I could have definitely turned them off to it if I would have taken that approach. I think everybody's just a little bit different. Um, my daughters aren't introverted. They, they're, they're much more like my wife. And so um, I found a lot of love just being out there because it was quiet. I didn't have to deal with people, didn't have to talk to anybody. And that sucked me in. I got to make sure I bring other people that my daughter can interact with. You know, we've got We've got a lot of hunts stacked up with, with uh camera guy, uh, my buddy Kayam, and he's just kind of been uh, on the last couple hunts, few hunts with my daughters. He's been a blessing because he is a fun individual. He's really right. talented with what he does, but he's not just there to do the film stuff. He is a fun guy to have around camp Right. Um, with my girls. They love him. They just joke around. It's like 
you know, he's 27 years old. He's still pretty young. Um, and uh, he's been a ball last for them, and they have a ton of fun. And it kind of, like, makes the trip be a little more boring if it was just me and, and my right. daughters. And so I find, like, I want to bring other people that, that also kind of keep them in the game out there. And time's been a, a great addition to that. But I don't know where I was going with that, but – I just found that I think everybody's a little bit different. You know, I really, yeah. I really worried about turning my girls off to this thing. Um, so when I went into it, I was like, man, I'm just going to make this the most enjoyable thing ever. I'm going to not hike in too far and I'm going to make yeah. sure they're warm. I'm going to bring hand warmers and, you know, extra puffy gear and a zero degree bag on those hunts when it's not needed, and, you know, um, extra large air mattress. And now I've gone as far as to, bring goats into the mix so that I can make camp even more comfortable because yep. I can only get so much on my back, you know, and, uh, and with the goats, man, now I can bring a cot for my girls and even a chair to sit in at the end of the day, a little Helinox, uh, a little bit of extra food and just some extra comfort. And the goats are helping with that. And, and, um, that was a big part of why I ended up with these things is I see some years ahead of me that, uh, these things are going to make these trips a lot funner for them right so you, know, you got a... when you have girls you got books and hairbrushes and extra yeah. shoes and extra clothes that we never had to even think about so no you made a comment there that i think is makes for an interesting segue i was listening to you chat with phelps the other day and you were talking about how essentially the, the attitude is basically the single most important thing that you're looking for when you hunt with people and you're very selective these days about who you spend um, time with in the backcountry, and I'd like to, I'd like to dig into that a little bit more because I do think it's one of these things that I don't know if people feel like they either have it. You know, it's you know this growth versus fixed mindset. Is this who I am and it's who I'm going to be, or do I have the ability to change who I am and adapt my personality and and characteristics? But you know, what are some things that you're thinking about when you do, you know, consider hunting with people or, or what, how does that attitude, you know, play into time you spend with other people out in the back country? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, uh, we all have our selfish reasons for why we do it. I don't go out there for, um, I don't go out there to drink and party and just have time off. Off. that's just not why i'm out there yeah. um i want to be out there pushing my body to its limits i want to be out there trying to accomplish the goal that i set in front of me and that's filling a tag on a mature animal so going out there with guys that don't have a similar drive or work ethic guys that are negative guys that'll easily quit on anything um those definitely aren't the ones that I would want to surround myself with. So, you know, I have a narrow group of people that I hunt with these days and I was very lucky growing up. I had, uh, had a good buddy in Joey who we were basically the same people out there. I mean, we had drive, there was no quit. There was never like take the easy road. And, and so, you know, I have a few guys that I hunt with today and I've stuck with them because they're same mindset. I don't have to worry about them quitting. And also, if there is a tragedy back there, I have all the faith in the world that they're going to be able to right. pull me out. Um, these are guys that will figure things out. They'll they'll make the good, the right decisions um, in that moment of truth. So there's very few people out there that put all that much trust in. Um, you know, I think Brian is a guy. Most people probably know I hunt with Brian. Yep. Paul over there with Gritty quite a bit. Um, I find that I, I, I love his company. I mean, he is a talking son of a gun. He, uh, he will hold court all night and then some until I crash out and fall asleep. Right. Um, and I'm a quiet one, so it kind of works well, surprisingly. And, and, uh, but he's a guy that is tough as all get out. Um, for folks that don't know, the man never quits. He just doesn't, you know, he's not going to stop because he's tired or he's got something you know, bothering him, um, you know, physically, he just doesn't quit. And he's very intelligent enough to figure things out if things go wrong. So he right. over and over makes the right decisions when it comes to that. 
Um, so there's, there's those type people. And that's kind of what I'm looking for when it comes to a hunting partner. Um, you know, I've hunted with quite a few people now at this point, and there's been some that I get along with them great outside of hunting. But when we get back there, the negative just shines like a beacon and it drives me crazy and I see where it takes us and I want to try to avoid that. And so it's usually, um, one trip and, and we don't hunt again, but I think positivity is one of the most important uh, pieces to uh, finding a hunt partner, somebody that's willing to put in the work and stays positive throughout the hunt because it can go sour real fast with a negative person. Yeah. I, it's funny. I do a ton of solo hunting and everybody thinks I have like a screw loose or a, and don't get me wrong. I quite enjoy being by myself probably a little bit too much, but half the reason I do most of it is I just can't find people a, that want to do the same type of trips. And now that I'm fortunate enough to hunt with the frequency that I do, not a lot, of, this is not a lot of other individuals like grown men who have the same flexibility of schedule that I do. Sure. So on, on that note, and I know this is a tough question, but do you have any advice for people on like how to find hunting partners or what you're kind of looking for? Um, when you're considering people to be a hunting partner or ask them to go on that kind of first test the waters type of hunt? Boy, I wish I had a good answer for this. I have been asked that a lot. Like how the heck do you find the the right guy? And, you know, I think what I've noticed and, um, I hope people aren't upset. I'm talking about this summit a lot, but no, please do. we've, We've, we've thrown these summits over the years and, um, and you get like minded people, who come to these events. It, it's funny. You never know who's going to show up, right? I mean, they come from all States across the U S here and they show up in Montana for these four days of fun yep. and education. There is a like-mindedness to that group. And so we have seen, and it is, it just puts a smile on our face. Every time we see it, these hunting buddy connections that come from these events. Yep. Um, it's tremendous. Like it, it just happens. It just happens that way. All these guys are people who, show up wanting to be better. They want to figure things out. They want to, um, talk to, uh, other folks that they may want to hunt. Like they emulate, they want to emulate them in the woods. And so in the end, um, partnerships come from that. And, you know, the summit isn't easy. We try to make it hard. We, we do some hikes that are difficult that really test people. And we leave people walking funny for sure. And, uh, and we, we give them challenges and they shoot with other guys that, that push them. And so, um, I found great community back in the day and a ton of other like-minded guys that I would absolutely love to hunt with. And I would have, uh, in the, in the train to hunt days back when we did that. And it's just like, you know, a challenge, a challenge, uh, an event where you're challenged and it's, it's more, it's really difficult. And most of the guys that would show up to that are folks that, again, they, they like to suck, like they're positive. They keep with it. They're willing to put their bodies through some stuff to achieve their goal. And a lot of hunting buddies came from that back in the day as well. So I feel like, you know, there's enough events out there. There's enough challenges out there in the hunting space where you got to put yourself in those environments and, uh, man, there's a good chance you might find somebody, but you know, I don't know as far as like social media, you never really know who people are. Um, yeah. They all seem great, but um, uh, I have, I can think of one hunt, I'm not using any names, but I can think of a hunt where I I met somebody through social and um, long story short, we ended up doing a hunt together. Okay. Um, And it was, uh, it didn't go well. It just didn't go well. Um, They pulled out within a few days of a 10 dayer and um it really bummed me out to see the lack of commitment on a hunt that was planned for two years Wild. it was like it was a big letdown like um man this is not what they appear to be online they appear to be this tough go go you know get up the mountain at all costs you know mountain no mountain too steep and i quickly realized that is definitely not the case um you know uh, climbing up 500 feet was a was a challenge for him so yeah, I think you got to be careful about picking people through that, but finding, um, you know, whether it's a tack event or, you know, there's so many different challenges out there, you know, Spartan races used to be something that we were into and find people who are willing to put 
themselves through to suck like you're willing to put yourself through it on a hunt and um and pay attention to how positive they they stay through the uh the real hard stuff i think that's a great piece of advice i've had a bit of a learning even just in the last year because i always tend to have this kind of like isolationist perspective and i felt like if i didn't do everything myself i was cheating somehow and i've realized you know the the level of success that i'm having is increasing and and part of that is because i've become more community oriented I'm trying to build more relationships with other people and they share tips and they'll give you, you know, a couple points here or there. And it's like they're, I, I, I do think I used to almost romanticize this like solo mentality. I'm going to do everything myself. And I think the more I'm, I'm learning is that building relationships with other people is equally as important, not because you're going to grow from it. You're going to learn from them and hunting really is a community. And I, I'm, I'm really starting to, to see that now and people will reach out to me and I have the ability to give them a couple tips or I, I went up in this drainage a couple years ago, go have a look or they hit you up in the middle of a challenging hunt and you can help them out. And I think having that, like it's, it, I don't want to sound cheesy, but like, it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to like, like, I think it takes vulnerability. I think that's what it is. And I think that what may be tough about finding a hunting partners, cause you are kind of putting yourself out there. And I think for the guy's guy, I think some of that can be challenging at times as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we, we have, I mean, we live in a time here where we're, we're I still feel like we're in the golden ages when it comes to to hunting. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of negativity. The, the animal numbers are down. There's so many people out there in the, in the woods and man, I, I wish people could go back and look at what, you know, like the eighties were like, the eighties were busy. There's a lot of hunters out there, a right. ton of hunters out there. Um, we still got it pretty good. We still really do have it pretty good so that we can make a million excuses why we're not filling tags. But if you're a go-getter and, um, and you want to figure it out. We have all the abilities. We have all the opportunities in the world right now. But when it comes to solo hunting, you know, I absolutely love solo hunting. It's, 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 it's what I grew up doing the most. Right. And, and, um, you know, it allows you to not have any outside influence. Every decision is on you. And I really enjoy that. And every year I make sure that I, I do a couple of them. Um, you know, I'm kind of, you know, married to these projects that we do these days. And so I, I hunt with others. And like I said, I'm just very picky about who we hunt with, but those hunts are fun, but they're different because there's outside influence. Like we all kind of come to a group decision as far as what we're going to do that day, how we're going to approach the animal, this and that, but man, there's something very, very, very sweet about going out there and doing it all yourself and not having anybody else say anything. And, uh, you know, I had one really good hunt this year that, I just, I didn't want anybody to come with me. I didn't want a camera guy. Um, that's for sure. And so went off and did it. It's been a couple of weeks doing it. And, uh, it was one of the highlights of my year selfishly, you know, when I got back, I, I ended up taking a great animal and man, I just really, really enjoyed being out there by myself. I could go as slow as I wanted. I could do things that maybe would have, um, irritated others and, yeah you know, wasted time, I guess others would consider wasted time, but I just love everything about it. And, um, like I said, I think, you know, having a combination of all those, if I was a solo hunter only, I'd be a different person today than yeah. in, in my community be much smaller than it is. Um, since I've now taken on this role of hunting with so many other people, you know, the community is great. I don't think there's a better one out there when it comes to uh, community than there is in the hunting space and so you know we do we do these events largely in part um in just that growing community and uh, the connections you make um some of them are lifelong but man it's just um it's been amazing since since we got into this space and and I really have kind of opened up the fact that uh, we're going to share share our experiences and share our, what we know with others. And, um, in the end, now we have a, a community like no other. It's fantastic. Okay. I'd like to take a little bit of a left turn and talk about health. And I know everybody always wants to romanticize training like a savage and, and all the rest of it. But, you know, as I'm in my mid forties and climbing up towards my fifties, 
my version of health and the kind of things that I prioritize and what's important to me have changed. And I'd be interested to hear from you at, at this point in your life, what are some of your priorities and what are your, some of the things you don't compromise on or what are some of the things you're putting energy into in regards to your health that you kind of see moving into this next decade of life that are most important to you? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a good one. Um, me and my wife like to talk about health quite often, uh, especially my wife. And she is a, a very smart woman and physician. So, you know, uh, things have changed for sure. You know, I have hit the big five Oh now, Jay. So I just got there. No one and... would believe it watching the videos, but we, we know it's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm getting up there. Can't believe it's, it's gotten to this point, but, um, as far as health, like what, what I treat it, how I treat it now versus how I treated it in my twenties is very different. You know, in the twenties, it was, you know, you wanted to get big and you wanted to get ripped and you're, you're in the gym and, yeah. um, and pushing and pulling stuff for, for gains. And, you know, now I'm not really looking for gains. I'm looking for kind of just maintenance. You know, I want to make sure that my body stays strong. Um, and, and I'm using it and never letting it get to a point that uh, it's going to be hard to get it back. Like I, I feel like that's the biggest key for me is just, um, just keep on keeping on. I mean, I just don't ever want to let it go. So I'm never, I'm never taking a large amount of time off from the training right. and the workouts. And my workouts are not like everybody else's. We all got our different things, but. You know, I love to, I love to hike. I love to hike with weight. And that is, I feel the most important piece that when it comes to hunting, yes. now there's other things as well, you know, keeping joints strong. So you definitely, you definitely got to push, pull some stuff and you got to, um, got to move some weight to, uh, maintain that and not just continually break yourself down. But, you know, for me, it's just maintenance. You know, I, I do things that I feel like are going to translate the best for what I love to do. And then on the diet side, it's just real simple. There's no secrets to it. I think it's just trying to eat as clean as you can, uh, cutting out sugars. It's the poison that kills us all. Right. And it does mm -hmm. the most damage. It's inflammatory. It's just poison. And so, uh, eating as clean as you can, I think as hunters, we have the ability to do that. We usually have fat full freezers and, uh, great, great on that end. Um, but that's, it's very important. You know, we supplement with certain things, but I think the, the easy answer to diet is just try to cut out the crap, you know, right. kill the toxins and don't take in so much sugar. It's easy to do fast food. Um, you know, doesn't affect guys in their twenties as much as it affects a guy like me in my fifties. Yep. You know, I feel like absolute garbage if I was to go eat something from a fast food restaurant now. Um, just lit, no energy and I just feel like crap. So, you know, I think, um, I think it's real simple. It's just the clean eating and, you know, never letting yourself go. Um, I see guys that do and they have a really hard time getting it back. You know, I spoke 100%. about my dad and I saw my dad kind of, uh, let up on the reins when it comes to fitness. Uh, he quit doing what we used to always do, spending time in the mountains and let himself go. And when you want to get it back, it's, almost impossible to get back to where you were. And that's where the injuries come in, you know, and, and there's also the side that, you know, overuse injuries are a thing for sure, uh, especially with legs. And that's why I hammer on the anti-inflammatory supplements that, that we take all the time, whether it's turmeric or, you know, I do CBD, which not everybody does, but, um, I really focus on the recovery part. Um, uh, are you a big you fish know, oil overuse. guy? Yeah. Well, yeah, we do krill oil a okay, lot. Okay. Yep. Yep. Used to do fish oil and now I do a lot of krill oil, which, um, found to be really effective, but I think turmeric is one of those ones that everybody should be taking. Yeah. You know, there's a few key supplements out there. Vitamin D, most of us are deficient. Yeah. So, you know, vitamin D is an important one for not recovery as much, but all things health, um, you know, a good multi and then, uh, turmeric, some guys really dig the glucosamine, things like that, but, uh, CBD and turmeric are, are big for me. Those are two that I feel like have done a lot. And, and all I can go on is I, I don't get sore. I don't get inflamed and, um, it's gotta be a result of clean eating, 
combined with some um, some supplements that are anti-inflammatory. And so um, I'm, I feel great at 50, man. I, I say this, I've said this a million times, but I could crush my 20 year old self with ease now. And I just don't get sore. I, I, you know, I heard guys growing up that were in their forties or thirties, forties, fifties, and they were always saying, Oh, you wait, you just wait and see, uh, you're not going to be doing that. And, um, you know, being stubborn, I want to prove them wrong. So they also told me that if I wore a hat every day that I wouldn't have any hair. And that was That's clearly not, not an issue. Yeah. I've, <laughs> I've done it every day and I still got a head full of hair, but, um, you know, those were guys that weren't proactive. They weren't taking yeah. care of themselves as much and they let themselves go. And, uh, so they would get sore and, you know, I can remember my dad. I mean, he was, you get out, you get back from a, a good trip in the, in the mountains chasing mule deer. And there was days of being stoved up and just walking funny and, being really sore yeah and i used to be like that i was like that well into my 30s you know uh end of the season would come around and it would just be painful uh i would have sometimes six weeks of of just inflamed joints and just stiffness and and it sets you back and that just never happens anymore and i think the biggest reason was just um cutting out all that cheap crap um sugary snacks that we would just pound when we were in the mountains so we've ditched those and added a few supplements and voila here i am at 50 and you can't get me sore on the mountain now i can't hike far enough to get sore or feel wiped out at the end of 10 days it's just not the case I'd love to hear some recommendations for food in the backcountry because I feel like most of us can do a pretty good job when we're in our own environment with all the controls. But then when you look at what we pack into the backcountry, it's stuff that you would never eat when you're at home because it's calorically dense, it's pre-packed. Like it ticks a lot of the boxes from a mathematical perspective, but I mean, I know myself, I got way more sugar than I should have in there and other processed garbage. Um, I'd love to hear some some tips or recommendations on things you've found that have worked for you to, sure. to still, you know, hit the caloric goals you, you have, but do that in a more kind of healthy way. Mm-hmm. Well, let's start with dinners and, and breakfast and things like that, I'd say. Um, now, you know, I've been around a while. I, I've got a few extra dollars to burn, so this isn't for everyone, but a freeze dryer. Man, I can't speak highly enough about a freeze dryer. I invested in one a few years back. And it has absolutely changed the game when it comes to meals that I'm able to make. You know, I went for years using a dehydrator yep. and it was really good. You know, it, it was good on some meals. I make really good, you know, spaghetti dishes with wild game and stews and things like that. But I would lose a lot of the nutrition when it came to dehydrating. So I wanted to keep eating the same stuff I eat at home, but I was losing some nutrition. It takes longer to, to rehydrate it. So I was losing some, so I invested in a freeze dryer. Okay. Now I'm able to make, you know, the same breakfast that I eat at home, which usually is an egg-based scramble of some sort. So I'm getting a lot of vegetables in there. I'm getting the fats. I'm getting the, um, with some of the wild game sausage and I'm getting the eggs for protein. And so I make these really amazing scrambles and I just freeze dry them, package them up. That's what I'm eating back there. Now I'll also make stuff like biscuits and gravy, which is a really sure. good one. Uh, loaded with fat, which I feel is one of the best things you could be eating while back there. Um, because that's what we eat out here a lot. Um, in my home life, you know, we, we have a pretty high fat, uh, intake here. It's just kind of a high fat, high protein and some veggies. And so, and with the dinners as well, like you can make everything that you would typically eat that you and your family sit down and eat at the end of the day, take that meal, freeze dry it. It's exactly what you can be eating eating on the mountain. So, you know, I don't have to go buy foods that um, maybe I haven't tried. Maybe I don't like, maybe they don't sit well with me. Maybe I don't know what the ingredients are. Um, These homemade meals are the best. I mean, they're exactly what you're eating. So you don't get the gut issues that I used to get when I would just buy meals from, you know, whatever sporting goods store. Um, They're just different. And when it comes to snacks, the same thing, you know, we can build so many good quality snacks. You know, we drink smoothies often in the morning, you know, that are loaded with this beef bone broth protein. Um, We'll put like 
a reds powder in there, or a greens powder, some creatine and just some really good stuff and some raw milk. And it's, it's just high nutrient. And I can build that same smoothie in my freeze dryer and do these little bites or just a whole smoothie. And then that's what I can eat back on the mountain. And, um, and then obviously the other things that you don't do with the freeze dryer, you know, um, nuts and I, I actually pack quite a bit of cheese back there. I do really okay. good on cheese, things like that. And so you're not going to see a bunch of bars. In Any my particular day cheese that you find lasts longer? Like you take in harder cheeses. I've always been curious about that. Cause it seemed like a really good fit from a macro yeah. perspective. Yeah. So I used to do the Tillamook cheese, the little slices, right? Yeah. Um, but they don't last as long. They definitely don't last as long. You'll get a, you'll get a mold on those things if you're in the wrong temps, but, um, man, those baby bells, those are hard to beat. Okay. And they're encased in a wax. Perfect. Um, little casing there. So you never get the mold and, okay. you know, I don't know what the experts would say, these cheese experts, uh, you know, what the right temperature is supposed to be, but I take those on summer hunts. I take those on winter hunts. Um, you know, those things will be in my pack for the 10 days that I'm out there and they're as good on day 10 as they were on day one. So I've never had a major gut issue or anything like that, eating, eating cheese out there, but I absolutely love it. It is a craving of mine when I get out on the mountain to have, you know, baby bells is one of the one of my favorites i took some of that moon cheese this year which i'm pretty sure is just freeze-dried cheese freeze -dried and i was cheese. having it with some uh elk sticks that i made and i was like okay yeah. this is we can do this and the other Absolutely. tip i got because of my my elk sticks were going moldy but if i vacuum seal them in like you know one two three at a, at a time and only open them up every couple of days that seemed to solve that issue pretty quick as well absolutely yeah i mean you can um you know, you can dehydrate your own jerky, um, beef sticks, you know, get them a little vacuum in onto it and then, or just take a zip, roll it up tight or toss an oxygen absorber in that packet. And it's going to pull a lot of that oxygen out and just kind of right. savor it. But yeah, there's so many, um, so many different things that you can do to your, your snack bag out there to, you know, you don't have to be eating, um, foods that aren't flavorful. I mean, you can sky's the limit. You just make your own. And uh, I just encourage everybody to try to eat very similar to what you eat at home so you avoid the the bloating and the gut issues. And it's pretty common out there when I talk to people. One of the biggest problems people have out there is they either get tired of the food that they're eating or their guts are just blown up and they're real gassy. And we've all been with that guy out there, right? So yep. uh, oftentimes that comes from, my opinion is, they're just eating foods that they're not accustomed to and they're introducing it and at the worst possible time, and that's on the mountain, um, on a hunt that they need to be at a hundred percent. I mean, you gotta be an athlete out there and you don't want to be, um, putting anything but rocket fuel in your body. So I think it's important to continue to eat as well as you eat back home while you're on the mountain and man, the freeze dryer guys, it's an investment, but my gosh, does it pay off? It really, really does. And you can do the math on it. And if you're a guy that hunts you know, maybe a week out of the year, it's going to take you a while to pay that off. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing, um, man, if you got a family or, you know, you go to work, um, and you want to continue to eat clean freeze dryers, I have mine running like 24 right. seven. When my wife goes to work, she can take whatever meals that I have and just add hot water. And she's got a good nutritious meal, um, at work. Same thing with my kids. They get home, I'm not able to make them something. Uh, she's not able to make them something. They know how easy it is to just heat up some hot water, add it to whatever, and um, get a good meal out of it. So it doesn't have to be just used for hunting. Right. It makes so many different um, snacks and meals that you can use throughout the rest of your life as well. It's a big benefit, in my opinion. I've already kept you an hour, Ryan. How are you doing for time? Okay. I'd like to cover one more topic selfishly. So <laughs> heading down to New Mexico in, uh, oh wow, two weeks. Oh, nice. Archery mule deer hunt. So I've hunted New Mexico once before. I was lucky enough to take a bull down there with my bow back in 2019. I'm going pretty South Mexico, uh, sorry, Southern New Mexico. So pretty arid, you know, kind of borderline deer, Audad kind of country. It's my first time in this unit. It's one of these kind of heavily roaded, 
very little timber. Um, I would call it maybe like a, a moderate pressure unit. Um, what are some pieces of advice or even maybe a better question is how do you approach going down by myself? Um, probably bivy hunt it, but not really probably just sleep at the truck. To be honest with you with the road network in there, I'm probably going to be day hunting, but I would love some, some advice or recommendations on things that you would keep in mind or some of the things that would be the forefront of your planning process when you were approaching a hunt like this. Yeah. Um, you know, it sounds like a hunt that's very similar to a lot of hunts I've done down in Arizona. You know, there's right. a lot of roads. It's really hard to get away from the road. So yes, as much as you want to be this badass backcountry guy, wherever you go, um, down there, I've found that, uh, you're going to be sleeping at your truck mostly. Yeah. Um, you know, in that environment down there, you know, it's, it's just the same as any other hunt I, I ever go on. My goal is to always learn the entirety of the unit first. Like I, I try to get down there ahead of time. I drive everywhere. I just try to not just pick up places to go hunt deer, but I want to know where the access points are. I want to know where other people are looking. I want to know where the pressure's coming from. And I just, I, I feel like I need to knock that out before the season starts Okay. because I don't want that in my head. Once the season starts, I don't want to be thinking, Oh, you know, I, I, maybe I should go look at this and see if there's anybody here. I just want all that knocked out ahead of time. Um, but my goal is always the same and that's to try to find unmolested animals, no matter what hunt it is, mule deer, coos deer, elk. And so, um, in your travels, you know, scoping out the unit, I'm just looking for off the wall, little places that people aren't going to be parking and that might offer up these little hidey holes, these little secret spots, these little nuggets out there that just aren't going to get looked at as much. And down there, it's just a glassing game in my opinion. It's, it really is important and it gets spoken of a lot, but it's finding those master vantage points that offer you up a lot of country. Um, hopefully a lot of country that other guys aren't able to look at. And so, you know, in my time spent in Arizona, glassing points, like they're not all that common. Like you, there's, there's few that offer you this, these expansive views that'll give you an all day sit to just be able to look at new country, but they're really important. And once you find them, man, they're gold. Um, but that's kind of how I treat every hunt, no matter where it is or what it is. It's always trying to find those unmolested animals and finding those places to glass um, that are going to offer up, you know, these little hidey holes that other guys aren't looking at. Sounds easy, but, um, it always kind of comes back to the same strategy. <laughs> What's your preferred optic setup for a hunt like that? Do you like big binos, little binos, you know, little spotter, big spotter? Like, let's say you got your wish list. What, yeah. what would you take on a hunt like that? Yeah. So, um, the first couple times I was down there, um, I quickly realized like, my set of tens or twelves that I use out west here were okay, and they're good, um, but they're not as good as a set of fifteens or a set of eighteens. Yeah, not in that country. Um, so I find myself down there up in the magnification quite a bit. You know, I love a good set of fifteens down there, a minimum of twelves. I would say, you know, you're just looking at big, wide open, like you said, timberless country, and you're looking at distance. Um, so my perfect uh scenario down there because i'm so close to the truck and i'm not backpacking in mm -hmm. um i'm crazy but i i will take a set of 10s or 12s but then i'll also have the 15s and then i always have either a 65 or an 85 spotter and these are th things that i would never take on a backcountry trip where i'm you know conscious of weight but down there you can get away with that you know you're not that far from a road somewhere and so um you know a big spotter, you know, in an 85, um, is usually what's in my pack down there. But yeah, the bigger glass is, is pretty crucial in my opinion down there. Cause you're looking for, you're looking at Oak brush and you're looking mm -hmm. for, for deer, you know, midday that just aren't getting up. So you're really having to pick everything apart. You know, there's the easy ones that are up on their feet in the mornings and the evenings, but you know, um, doing it right. You want to be behind the glass all day long down there. And, um, you know, set of 15s is awfully nice or 18s even it's funny i've i've reconverted so i was i've been lucky enough to do a little bit of coos hunting and mule deer hunting in arizona and i remember it showed up 
the guy I was with called the SLC 15s, the Coos Killers. Mm. And uh, so I was in that, you know, 10s, 15s in a spotter. And then I switched to do more backcountry stuff. So I actually went to the 12 NLs in a spotter. And then I recently just went to Colorado and I was talking to Robbie on the podcast. And he's like, you got to do the 10s and 15s, man. And so I borrowed a buddy's 15s and went back to that for Colorado. And I forgot how much I loved. It's also so... I don't think people understand the length of time you're going to be glassing. It's also different than like a sheep hunt or another hunt. Like you could be sitting down until your eyes bleed and there's a comfort level with the big binoculars, the 15s and the 18s. Like it's, they're pleasant to look through. Whereas I don't care how good your spotter is. It burns you out. Like there's only so long you can keep one eye closed for and still be effective and not like pushing through country instead of really picking it apart. And that was one of the big things I noticed going back to the 15s. It's like, oh, point. I like this. I can just sit in here all day. Yeah, absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I don't know about you. I, I don't last very long if I'm trying to scan the horizon in my in my spotter. Mm-hmm. You know, I love the spotter for, like, verifying. 100%. Um, it's it's there's, there's occasions where, you know, there's this far off base and I'm just looking for animals up there, but... For the most part, the 15s are going to spot it, and then you're just going to verify with your spotter and really dial it in and, and see what's there. But yeah, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I think um, being behind, um, you know, binos is much easier, and you better have some patience when you go down to those states and hunt those late deer. I mean, it's it's just a game of patience, and you have to be willing to sit all day long and spend the time behind the glass. And if you don't, uh, you're going to miss stuff. Absolutely yeah. going to miss stuff. Now, for a later season like this, where they are in the rut, what is your, how much attention are you giving does, or what part does doe activity play in your strategy to turn up a mature buck? It's it's everything. Yeah, I'm looking for does. That's okay. about it. Um, some of these areas that I've hunted in the past down there, down south, they're not high density deer areas by any stretch. Yep. So when you find a handful of does, um, that's the world. Like you're in it now. I mean, there's probably going to be buck close by, not always, but generally there's going to be. So, um, no, I get, I get excited when I see does, you know, when I don't get excited is when I see a deer, just a lone buck, that's just wandering through the flats down there. Um, you know, out in the Sonora or whatever, uh, because it's probably not a deer I'm going to number one, catch up to, right. I I probably won't see him again. Um, it's going to take some does to stop him and slow him down. If it's, if it's, actual full rut you know that front end of january there yeah yeah i'm excited man it's been i used to do arizona every year for coups and then covid hit and that kind of nuked it and i also do like to do a solo winter goat hunt at at home here which is like a pretty special experience so it's been a few years since i've been back to the southwest and i don't know if it's just because it's so different from home but it's like one of my favorite places in the world to yeah. hunt like it's just so severe and everything's trying to stick you or kill you and it's just like but it's also so open and i can breathe and like i love bc but it's like a pretty claustrophobic place in most of the places where sure. where i hunt and i i love going down there man i love everything yeah i'm it. i'm with you some about it it's uh it's quiet too yeah. i've noticed like i get mm-hmm. down there and i get on a on a vantage point or perch and it's just quiet you know once the jet comes by that it's way out there i mean it's very quiet it's warm you know a big part of it for me is you know i live in montana so generally most years we're fighting single digits or minus temps you know there's been several times i've gone down when i leave the house here and it's 20 below and then we go right into this environment down south where it's like 60 degrees in t-shirt weather um yeah, it's shock to the system, but it's it's just something something really unique about that environment down there. But what I've boiled it down to is how quiet it is, and it's just kind of peaceful. It's weird. It's not. It's a different kind of quiet than I find up in the uh, the nasty Rocky Mountains um, out west here. I, w- I would agree with you. Um, now we touched on the summit a little bit, but I know also this year you guys are kicking off the Bear Tour, and as we kind of like close things up. I'd love for you to spend a few minutes and kind of let people know the kind of things that you got going on this year, learning opportunities and otherwise that people could, could look out for. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, as far as the bear tour, this is kind of a new thing. You know, we've, um, we've held, uh, some events in the past 
down at the Peaks Equipment Office where or headquarters, where we'll put it out there, um, and we'd bring like a, a dozen guys, put it out there for a dozen guys, and it would always just sell out like within a minute and sold out. And it was a very small group, and those events have been fun. You know, me and uh, Mark Livesey and Brian and Bryce um, go down and, and talk at those things and have the opportunity to talk one of our favorite animals, and that's bears and where to find them and, and how to kill them. Um, so because it would go so fast, we thought maybe we open this up a little bit and just make it a bigger venue, you know, a more exciting venue with a lot more pieces to it. So this year, um, Livesey, they decided to kind of spearhead this. And, um, yeah, we've got calling it the Western bear tour and it's uh, a three city tour where we're starting off in Missoula. We go to Boise, we do salt Lake. So three different towns there. And it's just going to be a cram course in all things bear where we talk about our opinions on it, whether it's the gear that we use during it, uh, the tactics, the e-scouting, all the stuff revolved around bear, you know? Um, and so that's, that's kind of exciting. It's definitely out of my comfort zone. Again, one of those things that I'm doing, but, uh, I wouldn't do it if these other folks didn't push me to do it, but it is going to be a lot of fun. And so, yeah, all through March, we've got three different events and we've got a website that talks through the entirety of it and goes through each and everything that we're actually going to be discussing. And, and it's just going to be a fun two days, uh, two to three days, um, talking about bears with other like-minded guys. You know, this might be a spot where you find a good hunting buddy that's also looking to get into bear hunting out West. You know, it's gotten so popular lately, but there's still a lot of people that are just getting into bear hunting. And I love it. I love seeing that, you know, it was, uh, it was kind of quiet for a long time. We had it to ourselves, which is nice, but I also love seeing these young guys get, get out there and chase some predators and, and, um, not just fall hunt, but, uh, dive into this spring bear hunting that we, we all love. So, and there's a lot to it and there's a lot of questions. So we're going to be answering every one of them. So can, for people who are looking for that, is that going to be on Mark's site, treelineacademy.net? Yeah, you could find it on Treeline uh, or westernbeartour.com. Okay. You could go there and that kind of brings you to Mark's site, but there's a ton of information on it. So you can go there and look into it and see that all that is involved. Uh, there's several, there's several options when it comes to passes. Uh, there's a youth, youth pass and then, um, I don't know, it's all broke down there on the site and kind of goes through it. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited for it actually. And I'm usually not all that excited about, uh, speaking engagements. <laughs> I'm with you on the popularization of, of bear hunting. I, I'm a, I'm a bear fanatic. I love hunting bears. I love everything about it. And it's one of those ones where I might've been a little, not skeptical at first, but you know, they don't have any big racks. So when you first start hunting, you think everything's supposed to have big antlers. And it's like, the more I do it, the more I fall in love with it. And bears are one of those animals that you could just watch all day. Like they're yeah. so random. They do the weirdest stuff. And I think it's a great introduction to hunting. Like they don't, people think that's odd because they're a predator, but like they, some, they move a little bit slower sometimes. Like you can, you, they, they stick out a little bit more. I think, just think they're a great, and they're, they're at a time of year especially in the spring where like, there's not a whole lot of other hunting opportunities. So it's like, what are you even going to be doing with your time? Um, so I, I'm really excited that, that other people are, are getting in. I also love eating bear meat. I eat a ton of bear meat and, yeah. um, I'm glad that more people are kind of catching on to that. Cause I do think they're a fantastic hunting opportunity. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, you talk about the meat, the meat is our favorite and just the time of year, man, we've been cooped up for a bit. Yep. You know, some of us are lucky enough to go down South and hunt late, you know, like you're able to do. Um, but man, most guys, they've had months of downtime yep. and you know, you, you continue your, your workouts and your training and it's just an absolute great time. Everything's waking up on the mountain, man. You're, you're watching that green wave just kind of roll up the mountain. Everything's taken off and, and you're seeing the last of the elk drop their antlers and you're able to glass up bears. It's just an absolute a ton of fun hunting them and uh you're right they just do sporadic stuff sometimes yeah. you can't explain it random is the word that gets tossed out a lot bears being bears they just do the weirdest things and they're they're just a hoot to watch i agree but it has um you know bear hunting has become one of my absolute favorites you know it's probably right behind mule deer right now just 
And a lot of that has to do with the time that you get to go out. Yeah. And, uh, and also the places that they take you because they put you in some wild, wild areas. Um, you know, we're glassing up mountain goats and, and bears and elk all in the same frame sometimes in those spring hunts. So ton of fun. It really tests you. It tests your physicality. It tests your mental, tests your gear. You know, we've had years where we've been really lucky in the springtime and, and uh, great weather, but usually that's not the case. You know, you're testing all of it. You're usually getting a lot of storms in and out, whether it's just rain, sleet, snow, um, hot, kind of see it all in the springtime. So very good kind of um, entry to get right back into hunting and get to thinking about it again. 100%. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time, Ryan. I really appreciate it. To everybody who submitted questions for the Q&A, maybe I'll be lucky and I'll bug Ryan in a few months and we'll come on for a round two and we'll get into those because uh, ran out of time today. But I will make sure to put... um, Western Hunting Summit, the Bear Tour links, even some links to Hillary's stuff because um, I just think she's putting out a lot of fantastic information that especially do uh, men of all ages, but particularly as you start hitting your your middle and upper you know forties. I think she puts out a lot of really good stuff that people can take advantage of. Um, and I just want to thank you again, man. It was uh, it was a privilege, and I really want to appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no, no. Thanks for having me on here, Jay. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I haven't been doing a whole lot of podcasts lately, but uh, yeah, this was a fun one. So yeah, I'd love to come back on sometime and answer some of those questions. Hopefully they're not about hair and all that nonsense. That <laughs> usually when folks ask, to, ask about some questions, somehow two or three questions come in about hair, which I have no answers for. We'll keep the, we'll keep the hair questions out of it. Perfect. All right. Thanks again, Ryan. Thanks, Jay. Cheers.